Galatians 2, 20 and 21. I have been crucified with Christ, so I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. The word of the Lord. It's great to be here with you this morning. A couple of years ago, a senior who had graduated in May had sent me an email. And what the email started out by saying is, Go ahead and grab a cup of coffee and a comfortable chair because this might be a longish kind of email. For those of you who, who know me, I don't need to be told twice to grab a cup of coffee and find a comfortable chair. So I quickly put aside any other kind of work I had before me in order to be able to follow her direction. Now, just as an aside, I don't want you to be fearful, those of you who, who are in my classes and, and occasionally might send me emails, I don't want you to be fearful that if you send me an email, the next thing you know I'm talking about you in front of all the student body at chapel. I received express permission from her uh, to be able to share her story. And what her email went on to say is she wanted to know how she should know whether or not the boy that she was currently dating was the one. How should one know those types of things? And so she went on and on about how they'd been dating for quite a while, and, and she just wanted to know exactly. Does this sound not unusual for a Wheaton student? What are the variables which should be considered upon which making that type of decision? She was thinking that the relationship was getting to a point where that kind of decision was going to be made. And so the answer that I gave to her at that time was the same answer that I want to focus upon today for our chapel message. And the focus here is on God's word and my story. And that story involves the information that I gave to her. For I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But that verse has been very meaningful to me in my life, and it's influenced three specific areas that I'd like to speak with you about this morning. One is my commitment to Christ, and how that came about, and how it continues to be an element within my soul. The second is my relationship with others. How does being crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, affect the way that I relate to one another? And third, briefly, I'll share a bit about future decisions. How do you use these verses? For I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live to influence what you do. What choices do you make right here and now at Wheaton College? You're in a place of what you might feel is preparation. And that is true. And some of your future decisions are dependent upon the things that you're doing here and now. And so how do you use these verses in order to be able to speak to that. So my first point has to do with my commitment to Christ and the way that these verses have shaped that. I grew up um, in a home that was wonderful, um, but it was not a Christian home. I didn't know Christ, and although I had been brought to CCD classes occasionally in my first seven years, um, occasionally uh, a neighbor would have a, a neighborhood vacation Bible school that I would attend. And I heard some of the original stories um, about how God was evidenced uh, within this world. And I heard about Jesus Christ. But I didn't really know him. And really what I had learned about in my upbringing was more that church is a business. And then really what church wants is your money. And so that was the teaching that I grew up with is that this is a business and it just wants your money, so just as, if you wanna to go to church, that would be fine, but just as long as you know that at the outset. And I remember friendships that I would have during my growing up years, in fact, my best friend, Beth Cassidy, 
in high school. We were driving to the mall because, well, that's what we did. And so we were driving to the mall, and she had been to a youth group meeting earlier, and she said, Laura, you have to accept Jesus Christ because you're going to hell. Oh, okay, um, where did this come from? And she explained to me where this came from, but that was her evangelistic technique, is just to tell me I'm going to hell. So she was no longer my friend. <laughs> no joke. Um, and because she had gone over to the dark side, the dark side of the wacko Christians. And that's my term for them. They were the wacko Christians. And they were people who just wanted something from you. And generally what I learned, I went to college, um, was not a follower of Christ during college, um, joined a sorority, and searched for truth and meaning in a variety of different ways. And what I'd learned most about Christ or about people who followed him in my perception was that they weren't very much fun and they weren't very smart. I mean, goodness, how could you be very smart when you were following someone that you'd never met and you were being led by this spirit kind of thing? It just didn't make any sense to me. And smart and fun were two things I valued a great deal. And so every time someone would come up and start to speak with me about who Christ was and how I needed to follow him or at least explore him, oh, no, no, thank you. I just don't want, you can, you can do that, it's just not what I want to do. Um, I wanted to pursue my studies, I was an English major, I still love literature to a great degree. And that's what I wanted to pursue. And then I went to graduate school because that's what, for some of us at least, it was for me, that's what some of us do when we really don't know what else to do with our lives. And so I went back to graduate school because school was something that I knew how to do and I did pretty well. And so I thought, well, I'll just continue to go and do things that I do pretty well. And at graduate school, there was um, another person who was a teaching assistant, and he asked if we wanted to go play racquetball. Or actually, he came into our office and asked if anybody wanted to go play racquetball. And I said, oh, I love to play racquetball, I'll go. So we started to hang out together, and he was a lot of fun, and he was pretty smart. And then I found out. <laughs> yes, one of the other TAs told me, and she pulled me aside and said, do you know about him? And I said, what? What's, what's, what's wrong with him? You don't know? I mean, everybody knows. Tell me. He's a Christian. Oh, no. <sighs> and I really did have that response. Oh, no. What am I going to do? <sighs> but I like him. He's fun and he's smart. What to do, what to do. Well, what does anybody do when you are enjoying the company of somebody who has a different worldview than you do? What our response was is, as Christians, sometimes we want to convert them. It's exactly what my response was. I will just convert him. So I took him out, we went out for coffee, probably, knowing me, and um, I asked him, you know, I mean, think about what percentage of Americans say that they follow Christ? I think the latest poll numbers were about 85%. So, you know, maybe he's just, though, that kind of Christian. You know, I mean, kind of everybody's a Christian. It's a Christian nation, whatever. And so I asked him, you know, so what kind of Christian are you? I mean, I heard this story. Are you just a regular Christian? Or are you, at that time, we called them holy rollers. Are you a holy roller type? And he was a bit surprised by that question. And he said, well, um... I guess I'm a holy roller type. Oh, this is gonna be harder than I thought. So <laughs> I asked him, I invited him to come to some of the places that I would go to and to engage in some of the activities that I would engage in. And he came with. And although he didn't necessarily partake of all of the things that we were partaking of, he was a joy to be around. And when we sat down at a table at a local establishment and we all ordered up and it came to him, he ordered a Coke. And my friends looked at me and then they looked at him. I just shrugged my shoulders. I don't know, but he's fun. He's nice. And he didn't pull out a Bible and preach to us. He didn't tell us we were going to hell. 
he just hung with us. And he had a good sense of humor. And he enjoyed my friends and they enjoyed him. And that was the first time that I became even open to learning about Christ. Is because he just liked us. He, he seemed to enjoy hanging out with us. And so we enjoyed bringing him along. He was part of who we were. I remember a time when my friend said to me, you know, we're kind of uncomfortable with him just ordering a Coca-Cola. Could you tell him to maybe order something else? I had that conversation with him, and he said, I didn't know it bothered you that much. Of course, it's not a problem. Yes, the conversion has begun. <laughs> and I was getting pretty excited about that. We go out to our local establishment, we order up, it comes to him, he orders a Coke, and I give him the look. And you know the look? We talked about this, come on. And so then he orders, he says, oh, oh, hold that. Could I have ice with that? <laughs> hmm. And at that point, I was attracted to his integrity. Integrity is an attractive thing. It still is. And it still attracts me now to people. That there's a consistency between what he proclaimed and what he said he was and his lifestyle and his behaviors. And I'm not condemning necessarily alcohol per se, but it was something that was part of who he was. And he lived consistent to what he proclaimed. And in my world, that didn't happen very often. We were fans of situational ethics. And so that allowed me or it encouraged me to start asking questions. And as somebody who didn't yet know Christ, my questions were very defensive. I didn't want him to know I was vulnerable. I didn't want him to think that I even wanted to know more about Christ, but I did. And so my questions were attitudinal and arrogant, just as I was, and at times, still am. And my questions were about, so this, this um, Christ person is, so, so is the Bible your favorite book? Um, sure, it is. All right, so is this the deal that we find our favorite book, and then what we try to do is imitate the character that's in that book. So at that time, I really liked Gone with the Wind. Scarlett O'Hara sounded pretty good to me. So is that what I should do, is just maybe try to emulate Scarlett O'Hara in everything that I did? Well, he said, and he didn't mock me. He didn't make fun of my response, even though it was silly. He didn't treat me that way. He said, no, the reason I follow Jesus is because he is God incarnate. It's not just a character in a book. Another question had to do with, what do you pray about? So, let me t so did you pray about going to grad school? Yes, I did. Did you pray about what color socks to put on this morning? Um, no, I didn't. So, all right, so then, where's the, where's the demarcation between what we pray about and what we don't? Where is that dividing line? What's too simple or, or meaningless to pray about? Is there anything meaningless to pray about? Should we then just be praying all the time? In fact, what are you doing talking to me if you should be praying right now? And so my, my questions were along that ilk, very arrogant and kind of mocking his God. Do you have somebody in your life right now who's mocking your faith? Why not? Because those of us who, who aren't yet followers of Christ, we really want to be, or we want to know more about this lifestyle we just don't know how to ask, and we don't, know, we don't want to be vulnerable. I don't want you to think that you have the upper hand here. I don't want you to think that you have something that I don't have. Because sometimes we even claim that, that that's what Christian attitude is like. You think you've got all the answers. Well, you don't. I have some answers. But when you come alongside people like me, and you actually like us, it's powerful. And when you live your faith in front of us, it's powerful. It was for me, at least. So the conversion wasn't going well. It was going the opposite way. And so after I was asking all these questions, his responses were always gentle and scriptural. And he gave me a Bible, and I told him I wouldn't read it. I'm like, what am I going to do with this? I'm not going to read this. 
He says, well, put it on your shelf. I've dog-eared the page where you should start if you ever feel called or led to read the Bible. So I put it on my shelf. I wasn't gonna read it. Except what bothered me is our continued conversations, he was winning. Every time, in his gentle nature, and in the way that he was very scriptural in his responses, he was winning. And I tend to be a little competitive, and I don't like to lose. And so, I thought to myself, as any good debater might, I know, I will read his book, and therefore what will happen is that I will learn his arguments and I will use them against him. That's what I'll do. And then the conversion will be complete. So I started reading on page 1815. Well, you know what's on page 1815, don't you? It's the book of John. And at that time, I had already had the door opened so that the Holy Spirit could use the words of the Lord to convince me of who is this Jesus. And I started reading through the book of John and I couldn't put it down. And as I was reading and starting to realize that this Christ is a real person, this Jesus is the incarnate Lord and God has given us this gift so that we can be reconciled to him. And the truth of it, the magnitude of it, was overwhelming. And for those of you who who have a similar story to mine, and you know that when you look back at your own life and you suddenly come face to face with truth, it is overwhelmingly convicting and you realize your sinful nature writ large. And that's exactly what happened to me. By the time I got to John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one no one comes to the Father but through me. At that point, I fell on, on the floor of my boarding house room floor, and, and I just I cried out to Christ. And I asked him to forgive the sinful nature that I had and to reconcile me through his blood with the Father. You see, this gentleman had given me one of those little ditties that you get at church. We call them a blue book in our church. But they're just little steps, you know, the four-step method or whatever. And I had that. And he told me how to confess Christ and how to become a Christian. And so I had done that. And after I had gotten done just bearing my soul to God and asking Christ to come live inside me, I got up and I didn't feel any different. And so I thought, hmm, I don't feel any different. I still feel the same person. So I called him, and I said, could you come over because um, I just did something, and I just want to know if I did it right. So he came over, and um, I told him what I did, and I said, is that right? And he said, yeah, that, that's right. He didn't seem overly excited, though. You'd think he'd be excited. He didn't seem to be so. And I said, well, if it's not right, then why aren't you excited about this? And his response to me was that, well, you are gonna take a lot of discipleship. It, it is gonna take me, <laughs> I'm not kidding. It is gonna take me a lifetime to disciple you. So I'm gonna have to marry you. <laughs> and that's when we started dating. <laughs> because being a man of, of God, There's no way he would have entered into a dating relationship with someone who was an unbeliever. And so we hung out, we were friends, he enjoyed my company, but he wasn't gonna date me um, until I had come to know Christ. And uh, and he he still disciples me in, in many ways because he's a good man. And so I say these, I give you this testimony of mine, um, not just to share a little bit about my story, but hopefully to enter into your story as well. And I want to highlight a couple of takeaways that maybe you can gain from this. One of them is that um, for those of you who, who maybe are in the position that I was in, and maybe even being here at Wheaton College, which is a place that's difficult to have issues of faith, it's difficult because it just seems like everybody's supposed to have this deep faith in Christ, and, and it's not resonating with you. You're just not feeling that. For those of you who are in that position, I would encourage you to be honest with it. And be honest with those around you, those that you can trust. 
Be honest with your roommate, with your floor mates. Join a DSG for the purposes of asking questions. Even if they're mocking questions, even if they're silly, you need to ask them. And now's a good time to do that. You have a lot of resources here. Talk to a professor. I can only speak for myself and, and maybe the, many other professors that I've spoken with. The reason we're here at Wheaton College is that's what we want to talk about. We want to be at a place where our deep faith in Christ is integrated with our scholarship and our teaching and also with your lives. That's how we build community one with another, by talking about these very real issues. And so I would encourage you, be honest. The second takeaway is directed at those of you who were raised in a Christian home and have a firm faith right now. I wanna encourage you to walk the walk. Model your faith. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect. None of us are this side of heaven. But it means that when you're struggling, when you fail, be open about how that looks. What does it look like to have full dependence upon Christ for your sustenance, for your life? What does that look like? Because those of us need you. Those of us who are not yet confident followers of Christ need you, just like I needed my, my husband. I needed to see what that looked like in a lifestyle. And it's attractive. Focus on integrity, issues of, of making sure that what you say and how you behave align one with another. And the last takeaway has to do with um, the, uh, the painting by Rembrandt um, of, of um, the prodigal son. Henry Nouwen, in his book, Return of the Prodigal Son, identifies throughout the text, it's a small text, and anything you read by Henry Nouwen is outstanding, but in the, in the painting um, and in the book, Nowen focuses upon how we sometimes identify with that prodigal son, even those of us who are strong followers of Christ. When we fail, when we turn aside, we see the, the Father welcoming us home as we return to him. And so Nowen talks about our identification there. He talks about identification with the older son, Maybe those of us who, when we hear talking about how um, we're supposed to welcome these sinners, these lost people, we're thinking, you know, I have been following God all my life, and what do I get for it? Okay, I've never had a celebration. My father's never killed the fattened calf for, for my return. And sometimes that attitude um, comes into play. And so he identifies with both of those. And what he calls us to, each one of us, is to identify with the Father, and oftentimes we see the father in this painting or in this story as God himself, welcoming home sinners and encouraging those who are continuing in the faith. And now and in his text calls us to play that role, to see ourselves as growing into the father. How do we do that? How do you see yourself as the one who waits at home? And that's probably the hardest thing to do. How do we walk with Christ and look down the road for those who are yet to come to Christ so that we can run out to meet them. How do we encourage those around us who've been walking with Christ for a while and are getting weary, and how do we support them? For I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That day that I gave my life to Christ, I gave him the right to be the boss of me. Do you ever babysit and hear the two young kids, they're usually about maybe six and eight, and they're fighting with one another, and you hear, it's usually the younger son. The younger son yells out, hey, you don't have the right to be boss of me. Do you ever hear that? Or say that? Okay. When we come to Christ, what we say is, you have the right to be boss of me. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And so that's my first point, is, is just looking at how, does these, how do these verses affect our commitment to Christ? And the second point that I'd like to make this morning is how does it affect our relationship with others? And maybe the personal element that I wanted to share with you is my marriage. You know, so how's it going, Barwigan? How's the marriage thing going? 
And I'd said to you that my students had sent me an email saying, how do you know that this is the one? How do you know this? Tim Keller in his book, The Meaning of Marriage says, there is no right one, so stop asking that question. I think he's right. And I think what Tim Keller has done in his book, Meaning of Marriage, is he's actually taken an idea from Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in the book Life Together that we read together as a community a couple of years ago. And in that book, what Bonhoeffer says is, is that he can't stand people who think of ideal community, that you have this vision of what community should be like. And the reason why he doesn't like that is it actually destroys authentic community. That any time you have this ideal of what it's supposed to be like, it's never going to measure up to your vision. And so that vision actually kills authenticity of that community. And so Tim Keller takes that in his book, The Meaning of Marriage, and says pretty much the same thing. That raw mundaneness of the day-to-day, of how do we live with one another. And so the, the advice that I gave to my student um, was that she needs to look at the question differently. It's not so much what kind of husband will he be, it's not so much for me what kind of husband do I have, the question is rather what kind of wife does my husband have? And that's the part that I can actually contribute to. How can I look at my relationship with others through those verses? I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Christ lives in me. I am the hands and feet of Christ in my marriage. How can I look at this relationship and do the best that I can in order to have Mark have an outstanding wife? What kind of wife does Mark have? In this one scene from Lord of the Rings, um, we're with Frodo and Sam, and those of you who know me are chuckling because you're thinking, well, of course Lord of the Rings would come into it. Well, of course. And in this, in this uh, uh, particular, I'm not going to show the clip, although I sometimes do in class, we see Frodo believing that he has somehow been harmful to the fellowship. And so he is getting in a boat and he's moving out on his own. And Sam is running down and he's, Mr. Frodo, Mr. Frodo. And Frodo says, no, Sam, I'm going alone. And do you remember what what Sam says? I'm coming with you. (laughs) That's right. Yes, you are, and I'm coming with you. Um, And isn't this, don't we look at that scene and desire to have a friend like Sam? Throughout the movie, I could talk about very many clips where Sam comes alongside Frodo. I just, last night, Two Towers was on, and Sam comes and he pulls Frodo, because I've never seen it, so we have to sit and watch it. The Nazgul are there. He pulls Frodo out and gives the great Sam speech at the end of the... uh, at the end of that, the two towers. Um, and so Sam is wonderful, and how many times do we look at that and say, I wish I had a friend like Sam. I wish that someone would come after me, would rescue me from my isolation, from my loneliness. That's what I desire, that's what true Christian community is. And I challenge you to think about it in terms of, how can you be Sam? Is there someone right now, if you think about and reflect, at the end of this chapel message, which will end shortly, um, you'll have an opportunity to reflect. Is there someone currently in your life, your roommate? You know, we talk about sometimes um, some of us want to go forth from this place and we want to minister worldwide in the name of Christ, and yet we find it difficult to minister to our roommate. Your roommate probably does things like, you know, leaves food under the bed, and it it kind of starts to smell, it's horrible. Why does he do that? Leaves the dishes in the sink. Leaves underwear in the middle of the floor, so when you have other people over, well, it's kind of embarrassing. Why does he do that? And I've told him about it. It's not that I haven't said anything. And it becomes difficult. Let me ask you a question. Turn it around. Don't ask what kind of roommate do you have. Ask, what kind of roommate does your roommate have? What about your family? 
What about your friends? What kind of friend do your friends have? And dare I ask, chapel buddy. What kind of chapel buddy does your chapel buddy have? How can you seek, even in this venue, how can you seek to be the father? And how can you model an integrity to others who are literally sitting around you? And so that's what I would like you just to um, reflect on um, as we go into um, a time of just reflection as uh, Tim comes and, and plays for us and Kristen accompanies him. Thank you both for, for doing that. And as they're preparing, I'd like you just to also reflect upon life choices. We all are in specific places for a time. And the Lord calls us to consider other things. And I would challenge you to think about where you are right now, where is the Lord calling you, and how does this verse influence you as you're considering your next steps? I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me.